Hi, welcome to Real Magic Review. My name is Steve Faulkner and this is my interview with Joshua J. Before we do this, can you please like and subscribe if you like it and you want to subscribe to it, and you certainly should after watching this, and, and that's not because of me. And check out onlinemagic.co, that's my online community pro, program, resource, resource, that's what I was looking for. Course, over 600 videos, live sessions every week, usually by me, but sometimes every month by, uh, by guest lecturers. We've had Steve Reynolds recently, David Williamson, Luch, and, uh, and many more to come, so check that out. Now, this is... I was nervous about this because I haven't done an interview for a while and I was delighted with it. Not because of me, as I said, but I just really, really enjoyed, got inspired and left this interview, which was half an hour, Joshua, who's very busy, had half an hour, uh, wanting to talk for so much longer and we will do that. But in this, we talk about how magicians think, which is I've just discovered, had it sitting on my shelf. Um, when I knew I was interviewing Josh, I started reading it, and I just think it's delightful. You've got to check this out if you are a magician. If you think this is as I did, oh, it's just written for non-magicians. It isn't. It's a wonderful book. Uh, we also talk about this. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Uh, talk about tricks, uh, which he will talk. To, I'm not going to go into that now but we'll talk about in the, in the interview and the session. Now, I will say we didn't have long to talk about the session convention, and that's uh, uh, coming up if you watch this in real time or on release. Uh, it's now June, time recording in July, the session's coming up. It is a wonderful convention. It's definitely my favourite. I haven't been to loads, because I don't get out much, <laughs> but out of all of them, the one that I go to, it's brilliant. Uh, and I, I really want to get over to Magi Fest. But, you know, if you're thinking, if you're on the fence and you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure whether I want to go, do come along. I'm going to be there. I'm just uh, not that that's a reason for you to come. Probably a reason for you to avoid it. So uh, no, I'm not going to be there actually. Um, but it's it's just wonderful. So so use the links below to to book that if you want to do that as well and the books and and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I'll stop rambling. Here is my interview, which was lovely. I'll say that again with Joshua J. Okay, so Joshua J. We were just uh, talking about. Uh, the fact that I have your new book and you don't. Yeah, <laughs> I'm <laughs> amazed by this. <laughs> Which I'm, I'm delighted by. It makes me feel yeah. really important, <laughs> falsely. Uh, well, that's good. Well, mine's arriving any day and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be excited as well. But for the time being, you've got this beautiful thing that I haven't even really examined yet. Close. Well, well, uh, you'll. So I wouldn't usually do this. I always try and talk to people first about other stuff, and then you know, not to make it about the product. But I can't help it because I'm. I got it like an hour and a half ago. It arrived, <laughs> and it arrived. Uh, I was on a bike ride. I kind of was clearing my head on a bike ride, and um, and I I saw I got an email saying that Vanishing had delivered the thing, and I was really excited. I thought because talk about tricks, huge fan of the. We'll talk about the original. Um, uh, thing there, but I was I, so and it, it had been dropped in my shed. It said it was in my safe place in my shed. All right, so I went in my shed and I'd forgotten that I'd also bought second hand these. Oh and they, yeah, uh, and they were in a little envelope. And I was I looked at that thinking it was talk about, and I was really disappointed. I was like, "What have you released? Like a best of? Is it kind of like an edited down?" <laughs> it's a little, it's then, a little flimsy little thing. <laughs> I was just like, "What?" Um, and then I went to the next door neighbor shed and uh and boom, Look at that. boom. this is phenomenal i i want to get straight into just that for a second i want you to you would be the best person to to just give us a, a brief kind of overview of what that is from the years 2001 to 2013 i wrote a talk about tricks column in magic magazine it was on average five tricks a month sometimes it was eight tricks sometimes it was two tricks um from all of the great magicians of that era and so i got to every month learn and describe tricks from some of the greatest magicians that were then alive and a shocking amount of them have since passed on and um what a great First of all, what a great time capsule into that era, which isn't so long ago, but also what a great snapshot into what close-up magic was looking like. And in a broader sense, I got to have some kind of small little amount of control over what kind of trends and 
uh, cool things were happening in Close Up Magic at that time. So those books are 868 tricks all about magic in that era. I can't, I can't get my head around. So we're going to talk about your ridiculous productivity in a minute. Um, but I can't get my, my head around the, pro, the process. So in that process, am I right in saying you would have had to field different tricks? People would have sent you in different ones and you would have had to go through a process of going, yeah, no. So how did that, what was that process like for you? How much time did it take? You know, give me, give me, a, <laughs> give me a lowdown on that. It, it was a crazy amount of time. That's the first thing. It, I, I can't believe I did it for 12 years either, especially because it was started when I was in college when I was so busy. And then, of course, I moved to New York and went full time and was was doing, you know, tours and everything else. And I still did it. But it, it really I said this in the new intro that I wrote. It became one of the rhythms of my life. You know, that was just something I did. Believe it or not, when it started, I took over for John Rockerbomber. I received a box of VHS tapes because he used to go to conventions with a camcorder and record people performing their tricks. And I did that in the beginning. I would record people yeah. performing their tricks. And then, of course, eventually I would see people at conventions or they would submit them written up or they would make videos. At the time, it was a really big deal to make a, a webcam video. Um, yeah. And they would submit tricks. And, you know... It became so popular that actually the biggest drain on my time was weeding out the submissions that yeah. didn't make. And, you know, that was really tough because a lot of times I would say like, hey, I really like where you're going with this, but I think you got to clean up this handling. Or have you thought about doing this, but making it examinable because it uses three gaff decks right now and nobody's going to do that. And, you know, it was a lot of correspondence, but what a joy. What a pure joy. I look back on that time period as being really happy. What what a, a grounding. I mean, I know you were knowledgeable before that. I'm not saying that was your, but your, you, you, I listened to an interview you did with Damien, Vanishing Inc., and you were talking about vocabulary. You were talking about how a magician has learns a vocabulary and to talk about magic to other magicians, and that maybe a lot of magicians don't have that. You know, we were talking about how magicians think, which I want to also talk about in a minute. That process and whatever you were doing before that must have given you such a an incredibly strong foundation even the tricks that you didn't accept you must have learned so much i suppose You're the question right. is yeah and and the question is if someone now as a magician and and i speak from my own you know sometimes i have big gaps in my knowledge and i think i want to saturate myself i want to improve that foundation of knowledge and they haven't got that opportunity where would you say is a good place to to start to build to build that general knowledge of magic that feeds into it yeah so so, right, well, what, what you're talking about, and that kind of bleeds into how magicians think and the reason yeah. that I wrote the book, but, but to make it specifically with, with talk about tricks, I realized that I was the luckiest beneficiary of that column, much more than the people who read it, because you learn an exceptional amount when you learn magic on a line-by-line -line basis. And so I'm an English major. That was my specialty, my, my emphasis in university. And... When you learn about editing, you know, you learn many things. You learn that second draft is first draft minus 20%, which is yeah, such yeah. a great, which is such a great rule for magic too. If you have yeah. a trick at six minutes long, draft two of the tricks should be four minutes long. Like you yeah. should find a way to really condense things down. You find that you get edits on content where people say, I really don't like your argument here, or there's sort of faulty logic, or it takes you too long to get to the point. But then you have another kind of editing that we call line edits, right? And that's where somebody goes through and says, this shouldn't be into, it should just be in, or this word should be present tense, or you're switching tense, right? When you read or write magic on a line-by-line -line basis, you are forced to look at construction. And construction is a really hard thing to teach. So, for example, really poor construction would be um, you put the deck down, and you show four aces and then you square them up and you have to pick the deck up so you can count the aces onto the deck to ditch one of the aces. Well, why'd you put the deck down if you're just going to pick it up again? That's, that's a glaringly bad construction. But believe it or not, a lot of magicians overlook that sort of thing. Like they'll say, now reach into your pocket and, and get a pen. And, and a second later, they'll say, now just go into your pocket casually and steal the fourth coin. Well, why wouldn't you steal the fourth coin by putting the pen in the same pocket so you can do it at the same time? It's economy of motion. It, it... So when I got to 
write up tricks from the masters, Bill Malone and Ed Marlowe and Jeff McBride and Harry Lorraine and Lance Burton and Paul Harris, you see the construction is so tight that every little thing has been thought through and, oh, he picks up the deck so that he doesn't have to go to the box and then he doesn't have to go to his pocket until the end and he can ditch everything. And you learn how that works. And so that all, that's a very roundabout way of me answering your question, Steve, by saying some very unorthodox advice, which is, I think every magician should describe their own tricks as if they were going to publish a book. I'm not saying every magician should publish a book. That would be a really bad thing. But if you, anybody watching this, write up your own trick, I promise you, you will discover inconsistencies, discrepancies, things you didn't notice until you were forced to teach them to the proverbial other person. When you say, th you know, something like, now uncap the pen and place it down uncap, but, but why? Why? Because somebody's got to pick that up and cap it, and now you're going to have a palm card when you do it, and it's going to be really awkward. When you do those things, you learn so much about your own work, and man, oh man, did I learn a lot from describing that much magic. I, I can imagine, I, and, and it's, it's just phenomenal. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll be talking about this, I'll top and tail this as well um, to let people know when it's coming out and when it's, but I've, I'm really excited, I've had a quick flick through it. It, is, it, uh, it brings up another question for me, uh, and, and I, I, I know this because a lot of my subscribers, I always say, what are your challenges in magic? And, and I would say 95% of them come back and talk about finding time to read, finding time to study, finding time to practice. And I get this book and I go, yay, brilliant. And then I look at my shelves and go, I've said yay, brilliant 200 times in the last couple of years. And I do read, but, it, but there's this kind of frustration. And I think for some people, it's a genuine stress. It's not just like, oh, I can't get time for practice. It is a, it's like, how do I approach this with all this material? And have you got any advice for somebody who has got all this wealth of information of how to approach their books and their study and how do you with all the stuff you're doing still still manage to yeah well i mean that's a very general and a very specific question the specific yeah. question of how would i advise people digest the books is of course in any way they like i, I personally love compilation books like this i love combing through them and letting letting inspiration just wash over me but i know that's not for everybody not everybody can say for the next four or five months, I'm going to just enjoy these books one by one, page by page, and it's not going to be a rush. If you are more data driven and more goal oriented in the way you read magic and digest magic, we have, thanks to Mike Vance, by the way, for doing this, we have cross indexed them very, very thoroughly. And there's no book set like this. So for example, if you want to learn tricks with banknotes, just go in the back section and you will learn 60 tricks with banknotes. If you want tricks with just a shuffle deck, like no setup, no Cy Stebbins, no nothing, go to the shuffle deck section. If you want to learn impromptu stuff without cards, go to that section. There's tricks with Christmas ornaments. There's tricks with holiday themes. There's tricks with pets. There's tricks with every possible thing you can imagine. And you can go in and just seek out the parlor stuff or whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, in regard to time, you know, I was thinking about this and I, I'll try out a new answer. I get asked this question a lot. And yeah, I, of course. I don't have, I don't, you know, the answer that I would typically give when people say, oh, you've written a book. Oh, you're on a tour. Oh, you've got a company. Oh, you, you're performing. How do you manage all the time? I, I sort of like give myself a little insult by going, well, I guess it's a lot easier when you don't have friends or a social life. And like, that's yeah. partially true. Yep. But the two practical things I can tell you, and I don't think that they're very nice things to say, or I don't think they're things that people would want to hear, but I'll tell you them anyway. Um, the average American watches 3.5 hours of television a day. I watch none. So that gives me 3.5 more hours to fit in the gym and, and meetings and writing and practicing and performing. I know most people aren't willing to give that up, but I watch a I watch pretty much just movies. I don't watch a lot of TV, so um, that's one place. And then the other way is like, I don't know how to say this again without sounding mean, and I don't mean it in a mean way whatsoever, but I mean, I love what I do, so I'm doing it all the time. I was on a 10-hour flight yesterday, and I did so much. I think I read two books and wrote the intro to the Wayne yep. Dobson yep. book that we're working on, and I did all of these things, and I looked around, 
and everybody on every side of me was sleeping and watching movies and doing nothing. And like, I'm not, this is by no means shaming anybody who wants to relax. Like I, I relax too, but like I did 10 hours of work and they did 10 hours of lounging. And so the way I fit it all in is because I love what I'm doing and I'm I'm always pushing it. That's sort of the answer. Yeah, and I don't think it's a, and it's it's a it's a fascinating one for me because of the the other side of what I've done for years, which is sort of personal development, time management, all that kind of thing. And it, and it's something that I think is it is easy to not answer like that because we're so scared of saying. But but I think it is that, and I and. You know, when people say, "Well, I've got a job, I've got kids," you know, I've I've had shared care with my kids, and and I'm not I'm not saying I'm not deeply frustrated. I'm still certain things I want to be able to do. But I, I I sometimes look at how many times I've picked up my phone, and my big thing at the moment is instead of pick, reaching for the phone, reach for a deck of cards or reach for, or, or, yeah, and it feels, yeah, but it feels deeply uncomfortable. Sometimes it feels wrong because I'm so habitualized into certain behaviors. And I think, you know, not having the downtime being Netflix in the evening and understanding that, that magic can be relaxation as well as work. And, and, and I, yeah. And, yeah. And it, it's that. And it's like, uh, again, not to be so woo woo about it because it's, it's really hard not to come off like I'm trying to sound superior and, and I'm not. I don't, I don't look at anybody as, as inefficient or, or not productive at all. It's, that's not what I'm saying here. But, if you derive true joy and true pleasure from getting something done, from from accomplishing something or, or getting something out, or, or you know, I'm gonna fix this trick today. I gotta fix this trick and make this thing really look right. And you just derive kind of joy and you set your mind up so that that's giving you real pleasure. Cause it does, yeah. I don't think I'm tricking myself. It's like, it feels no. great to write something that you, that you feel good about or to, to finish a task or to scratch something off a list. Then doing that makes you feel better than say finishing season seven of, yeah. of <laughs> garage or something, you know? And, and you know, I'm not trying to preach to anybody else on how they do it, but I will tell you that when people ask that question, it's it's so it's so hard for me to answer because it's just the way I'm programmed to do it. I'm not trying to to do anything. I'm just I'm excited about all these things. I know, and th- yeah, and that's th- that's. I mean, I think that's there's a double edged sword to that as well because I, you know. I'm so deeply excited about everything that my biggest challenge is not going everywhere. You know, like I said the other day that I was walking, you know, when I wake up in the morning, and I'm not saying this just to talk about myself, it's in service of what we're talking about. The challenge is that by the time I've got downstairs in my head, I've gone, oh, I could do the Rubik's Cube, I could pick up a deck of cards, I could do that, I could read that. And, and it's not allowing that to, to become the, it's, the, the problem. You're right. I, I'm with you. And, and I think that's something that quote unquote productive people suffer from <laughs> is the ability to say no, right? And I'm not very good at it and I'm really trying to be better. It kills me. It kills me when somebody reaches out and goes, I'm a scientist from University of blah, blah, blah. And I read your study on magic and we'd like to do a follow up and we have funding and a staff behind it and we'd like to bring you in and do it. And I'm just going, I know, oh, I know. I want to do this, but no. I can't be a part of another one of these studies. They eat up a year of my time. And, you know, and it's so hard to say no when somebody yeah. says, you know, I want to collaborate with you and and there's this thing in new york and it's food and it's magic and we should do it but it's rehearsal twice a week and it's like oh i can't you know but you got you gotta say no to some of these things so that the other things i here's what it was um i just read tom an article with tom hanks and my god i feel like this man is the most inspiring guy in the world yeah 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 tell me about it yeah and the article said that Tom Hanks was saying, learn to say no, because saying no to something is saying yes to something you care about more. Yeah. And wow, that's a great way of looking at it. It's like, I really hate to turn somebody down. You know, often it's just a magician I really like coming through New York, but I can't often give a whole day to just showing somebody around New no. York. But saying no sometimes to that is saying yes to finishing something i really wanted to do or to putting that time to rehearse something i really needed to get done you know yeah. it's hugely important and i think that is the the, the, the key and people struggle with it because we're wired to want to be kind and to help and to say yes to everything and and i think that yeah i, I could talk for so long about that um i want to briefly i want to talk about the session in a minute because that's been a yeah. 
that's been a process. Um, but I, I want just to briefly for for people watching this. I've got two books in front. Of, I've got a few books in front of me. I've got this. And thank you, by the way, for this is my most gift. I'm not just saying this because you're here. This is the gift I give to most non-magicians. That it has been for years, um, because it's uh, and and now this is the new gift I give to non-magicians. And I'm not saying that I, I've just because I've had this on my shelf and I haven't read it because my even subconsciously i think my my prejudice was saying it's a it's a magician's book written for non-magicians i don't need to read it and i've got another book in front of me which i'm so glad i nearly i felt the same way about i think these two books and i'm not i know i'm not just saying this to gush are probably the the could be the most magi important magician's book that people read because i think that they empathize with the spectator and this, and this idea, this mission you seem to have gone on, and I've been listening to the podcast as well, which, again, I'll tell people about afterwards, the How Magicians Think podcast, this mission you seem to be on of elevating not lay people's, non-magicians' idea and, and appreciation of magic seems to have become something that's really grabbed you. What, what was, the, what was the, the seed that sparked that mission? Where did that start? The seed that sparked it, interestingly enough, is Hold Up the uh, Magic, the Complete Course. So I wrote this book years and years ago, 2008, <laughs> And it's a beginner's guide to magic. It's a whole curriculum. And people would come up to me and they would say, my brother-in-law loves magic. I was like, oh, he's a magician. No, 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 he's not a magician at all. He just, when he goes to Vegas, he watches magic and he loves to see me do magic. So I got him your book. And I thought, thank you, but what a weird thing to do. Why would you buy somebody a book who has no interest in performing magic? That's gonna tell them how this stuff's done. Yeah. It occurred to me that there's no book that celebrates the craft of magic. Like I love movies, but I have no desire to like learn how to shoot a film or light a scene or inspire an actor or write a screenplay. But I want to I want to read about movies, a love letter to movies. So I wrote this and I think um, I can tell you that I think this is the greatest thing I've ever done. Um, it's the thing I'm most proud of. This is a love letter to magic. It's everything I love about magic. It, it is, if I could sit across from somebody who wasn't a magician and tell them why I think magic is important, why I think it's fascinating, why I think we need it, it's this book. It celebrates all the unheard of magicians. It celebrates um, magicians from the past who have died. It interviews Penn and Teller and Copperfield and Blaine. And yeah, I'm just, I'm super excited about it. And we spoke earlier, you, you listened to me chat with Damien. I think that the public and magicians, because it's very much a, a book for magicians and the public. It's not like yeah. something magicians can skip because they know all these things. I think there's a lot magicians can take from this book. But, you know, Steve, if you and I sat in a restaurant in a pub in the UK, we could talk about so many topics just because we as human beings have fluency in so many areas. We could talk about the food and whether we liked it or whether the pasta was too well done. We could talk about the music, maybe Elton John's playing, and whether we think Elton John's great or his early work's better than his later work. We could talk about movies. But very few people from the public can talk about magic with any kind of expertise. Yep. They don't know the difference between good magic and terrible magic, derivative and original. They don't know how to add drama to magic. They've never seen magic that has personality and, and heart behind it. And so this book is, is hopefully a primer for all of that. It is, and, and my question earlier about, um, and this is my discovery within the last few days, I hadn't read it, and, and you know, I've been researching and discovered all this, this stuff. My question earlier about is where would people get that vocabulary from? Where would they get that? And my answer is this, genuinely, because it's, it, it sparked something in me, because I get very jaded, I get sent a lot to review, I, get, I can get super jaded, and, and I need that, that dose of inspiration every now and then. And I would suggest to, to magicians to, to really check this out, don't write it off as a, yeah. because I think there's a lot, a, a lot for us in there. So uh, um, it's, it's just great. So anyway, but we've got a few minutes left. We've got to do this again because I've got, well, as you probably know, I could bang on for hours. Um, yeah. But I want to talk about the session because it's been such a, a process of, obviously, for obvious reasons, it was going to happen, it wasn't, it was going to, and one of the interviews I heard you recently was, oh, in January when we're going to hopefully be doing the session. And of course, so how, how is that? We're, it's next month. How is that feeling yeah. for you? Um, well, it's feeling weird. Uh, I haven't been to the... I'm usually in the UK four or five times a year for different shows and business stuff, and I haven't been in several years now. Hmm. Um, 
we've never done a session in the summer. Of course, this is making up one of the last ones that we missed. So it's going to be a great time finally to be there because it's the, the weather's going to be lovely. Um, you know, the session is so special. It's so dear to my heart. Andy started it um, with Rob James some years ago. Yeah, yeah. And then I joined in several years after that. And it's just got a close-up vibe, and it's grown. It's it's bigger than it's ever been, but it's it's by no means a large convention. But the camaraderie is so special, and I know you you always come, and you're a part of that. And there's jamming in the lobby, and you know this year we have Mike Caveney and Tina Leonard as our guests Amazing. of honor, and they Amazing. are they are national treasures to yeah, us. Yeah, <laughs> they, really, so they should I mean, be. Each one of their acts are so special, and Mike is such a great historical mind and, and collector and it i i just couldn't possibly be more excited we also have some names we haven't announced which i can't say just yet but i'm really excited about some of the people who are going to be there if you've never come to the session all i can say is this is an ideal time to come even if it's just for uh you know just on a last minute thing you should you should really try to be there because it's going to be great yeah, and, and I agree, and it feels different. I'm not putting down any other conventions, uh, but in, in my time in what I call my wilderness years, where I kind of got really disillusioned by magic, it was a session that actually was one of the first things I went to and went, oh, you know. So, so it's, it's yeah, I, I love it, and I think it's, again, I'd love to talk for you longer, but I know your time's limited, but, um, but I'll, I'll emphasize that. It's, and there's gaps, right? There's gaps. It's not just like bang, 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 bang. No, that's a big yeah. part of what we do is we really believe. And people say, why? Because we do the Magi Fest in, in America as well. Why do your conventions have such a better atmosphere than some of the other conventions? And like, you know, I wish I could take credit and say, well, we're really careful about encouraging or we ourselves go out. It's really simple. It's, I, I, I give my playbook to anybody organizing a convention. Give them time between events to be social and yeah they will be social it's not rocket science like most conventions you go to it's like eight to nine lecture nine to eleven competition eleven to eleven thirty lunch eleven thirty to we give like hour or 45 minute breaks between almost everything and you can't help but see michael vincent sat there holding court yeah. and enjoy it um steve before we go i'm going to turn the tables on you and just say that I am so impressed with this community that you've built and um, watching it from a distance. I mean, you and I have known each other for a long time, but you are doing such an important thing and giving such value to your community with the way you go about sharing information and disseminating things. And I've watched and we've even discussed internally at Vanishing Inc. what an exceptional job you're doing of training, but also empowering people and doing these video check-ins like what you're doing is unique in the magic world and i'm in awe of it so i'm sure that i know we're, we're basically out of time here but um at the session i hope we can actually find some time at the bar to just chat because i'd I've love got to questions for you oh that means an awful lot thank you so much josh right. um for that and for for spending uh, your time of course. Have, have, Anytime. have a I'll great come one back and, and visit you and your community when uh, i'd love you to time yeah good great thank you Thank you. Take care. Have a great one. So thank you very much. As I said before, um, well, of course, thank you so much to Joshua J. But use the links below if you're interested in the session, as you should be, the book, as you should be, uh, which I will do a review of as a separate video, of course. And, um, and any questions and comments, please put them below. And we will talk about this on the Comments on Comments shows on Thursday evenings at 5 o'clock UK time, most Thursdays. Uh, so on that, do like and subscribe, hit the little bell icon because then you'll know when sometimes when I can't go live and what's coming up and, uh, and share this please. If you liked it, share it with your friends, tell them about it, write about it on the forums and, uh, and that'd be lovely. It means an awful lot. And check out onlinemagic.co, which is my online community, which uh, I'm very proud of. So take care, have a great one. Thank you so much for watching and thanks again to Joshua J.